Mr. Tata, welcome to Conversations. It's a, a, a convention, almost a cliche, for a host to in, introduce his guest as one who needs no introduction. Uh, in your case, this is something that's quite literally true. Have you felt that a liability, to need no introduction? No, I'm, I'm very happy. Please don't introduce me. I don't think there's any need for this conversation at all. But anyway, I've Does agreed to, and I'm doing it, and because I've admired or I've appreciated the two conversations I've seen. I thought at least this fellow is, is, is uh, fairly kind to his victims and, <laughs> and makes things easy. So, Have you felt uh, inhibited about the fact that you're easily recognized, that you're a well-known personality? Does that intrude upon your life? Yes, but only in Bombay. Uh, I'm not known anywhere else really, at least not visibly or not by, by being seen. In Bombay, yes, uh, but you get used to it and uh, what can one do? The main thing, you, most of the people who recognize you and come to you or, or address you without knowing you uh, mean well, are friends, they mean to be friendly. Sometimes it goes to rather ridiculous extent. It's quite often for me in Bombay, in the car, uh, another car is by, by the side and suddenly a hand comes out and says, Mr. Tata, may, sh may I shake hand with you? And I said, of course, and then I talk to them, well, whomever I can. No, so it doesn't intrude in, a, in, a, in an objectionable way. If people uh, think uh, more of me than they, than they should or any justification for, then it's, it's their fault and they're wasting their time. What do you think of yourself? How do you evaluate yourself? I certainly estimate myself at a, on a much lower level than seems to be extended to me. I don't think that uh, I quite deserve the, the friendship, the, not the friendship is the wrong word, the, uh, the admiration, the, the regard that I get because after all, all that I've done in my life, except perhaps in creating Air India from scratch, from a little male airline, uh, I haven't done personally anything of uh, any... I've never created anything entirely new. It happens uh, that I inherited the situation. I got into Tata's. Uh, 20, in 1926 and uh, on the death of my father and thereafter from then on to now and to now main I had always there was always a good team Tatas and when at a rather young age for being the head of a group namely in 1938 uh, and you were what 34, 34 years old where uh, uh, and you were appointed by people who were your seniors? I was a senior. Well, because, uh, yes, I was, I was made a director by Sir Dorab, the chairman. Uh, and uh, and they, when, 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 sir, when the, the man who succeeded Sir Dorab, namely Sir Naruji Sakladwala, died, uh, the director had to appoint a chairman. And so they appointed me, I thought, somewhat uh, prematurely. And uh, I described it as a piece of mental aberration, but it seemed to have lasted. So, um, so I use that only to explain, in answer to your question, that uh, uh, starting with something that existed, a good, led by a, a team, a good team of people, uh, experienced and uh, capable, a team to which I only ad added in the, in the course of years, choosing the best people I could find to join us, those that didn't grow from, the, from within. Uh, so therefore it was a question of keeping things going and growing. Only a few things were added. Well, one of course was Air India. That was the one thing I may, I may feel that I had, I was wholly responsible for.
Was it a, a, a wrenching, anguishing experience for you to relinquish control of Air India? Yes, of course. But, of course, but at the same time, you, you mean much later, no? you're yes. talking 19, yes. you, we're going from that, That's uh, right. that event, That's right. event That's right. to 19, uh, February 1978, when Mr. Morazi de, de, de Sai fired me. Uh, he didn't inform me for, for about 10 or 12 days later, when I got a letter thanking me for my services to aviation. But I learned it from the man whom, whom he appointed as my successor. How does it feel to be fired? Well, look, uh, maybe uh, <laughs> I can't say the how. Uh, I think the answer is, cannot be a sensible one because I had never been fired before. <laughs> so if you mean, how does it feel to be fired for the first time on never having an experience? Well, it was not unexpected. Mr. Moraji Desai was the Prime Minister of India. He's a man with whom I'd had a, a whole life almost of, of uh, love-hate. We were friends and at the same time the man was quite impossible to, to deal with. I think everybody who knew him. Uh, so it didn't surprise me and, and uh, I thought that something, all things must end sooner, sooner or later. The way it was done was not very pleasant to me. Have you done a lot of firing in, 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 in your term as chairman of Tata Sons? I think my leadership, if you can call it that, in Tata's or in business, therefore, has been one of always thinking of colleagues as a team. If one didn't agree, there are ways. Um, I took part in firings, but not, uh, not in any way that involved me very deeply. It must be deeply because I had to approve. But uh, generally I avoided that. There are, there are other ways of dealing with situations and, and firing the man. So I, I can say on the whole, rarely. It's not a very pleasant thing to do if you have to. The Tata Sons and the Tata Group of Companies have, have evolved a reputation for uh, excellence. And, and you've mentioned that how you have been the leader of a team. What are the qualities of a good leader? Well, one of the things he must be, uh, I would imagine, he must be, his leadership must be respected by the team. I, as I'm, I've lasted so long, I must assume that I, I'm, oh, my leadership has been respected and generally approved. Second point I want to make is that I believe where there are teams, I believe in working on, a, on the basis of a consensus. Obviously, when human being, an intelligent human being, and, and who, are, who are themselves in their own field leaders of those, of those, uh, in those fields, and of the companies that are part of the group but are, are separately and independently managed, uh, we do have differences of opinion with the chairman of the group. There, there could be and there should be. But generally, unless it's something that um, is a matter of principle, I always found that, it's, that one can work on a consensus, either convince them, and if it's not something very serious and I can't convince them and they are very, very sure of themselves, I let them I, I accept their view. There's never, it's, it's never done like, say, in a, in a, in a, in a battle, in a war. It's, it's a, so it can, I find that working on a consensus is a good way of leading a team. And it makes, it makes, it makes things easier. There are always problems. We are full of problems in business, somewhat less now than we have been for many years when under the pressures of, of uh, alleged socialism, uh, but we always, there are always problems and difficulties and uh, sometimes also losses, losses also of, of not only a financial loss but the loss of a, a purpose. But if one is prepared to look 
look at things in a in a I don't know how to say it, in a human way, understanding that most of the decisions of others, even if they are adverse decisions, they are done in their belief that it's the right thing to do. Now whether Mr. Moraji this I thought it was the right must have thought that it was the right thing to do to fire me. That's a, that is uh, maybe an exception. Do you in some senses feel vindicated that globally it, it's, it's almost as if socialism is on the retreat and, 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 and capitalist free enterprise, the, the, the system of incentive is, is triumphing in a sense? I think one can. I believe that, that Tata's in, in most of their companies are following socialistic principles. Anybody who visits Jamshedpur, for instance, Tata Steel, sees how the thing is run, for whose benefit. F right from the Mr. Jamsheji Tata was a socialist. He must have been, because otherwise he wouldn't at that time uh, think in terms of what was far, far from what was thought of in, in other countries in regard to uh, labor relations, human relations. A man who created, he and his successors, and we created, uh, made decisions between management and labor that, had, that were not adopted even in the advanced countries of the world for years. It was Tatas who introduced the first eight-hour day, the first leave with pay, the first, a number of firsts. Now this, this could only be conceived and accepted uh, if starting with Jamsilji Tata there was, the, to me that was socialism. In some ways it has turned out, it may, be, it may turn out to paternalism, as, as people think it's paternalism. But uh, anybody who goes to Jamshedpur and studies the situation who thinks it's paternalism uh, ought to have his head examined. But that may well be sort of the exception to capitalism because capitalism has seen its aberrations too. But they were aberrations. They were the wrong kind of capitalism. It was, it was a way of life totally, uh, totally uh, free of any social feeling of social responsibilities. In some cases they were. You started your career when, when India lacked those very freedoms. Did you feel the impulse to participate actively in India's freedom struggle? But I even was stupid enough at one stage to think that maybe I should give up the idea of becoming a businessman or a, an industrial leader and join the Congress party. I was in, immensely impressed by Jawaharlal. Uh, there was a great love and admiration for the man. But uh, I soon realized I didn't, I didn't go too far in that thought. Because having seen, having attended one or two meetings and having seen, seen people in action, I realized that uh, all that would mean is to get myself arrested, go to jail, where I, couldn't, I didn't think I could do very much uh, for the country or for the party. But the main reason I didn't, apart from that, was to feel, it was the fact that I'm a, almost in apolitical or apolitical, I never know how to pronounce the word, animal. I cannot, I cannot, uh, I, I don't, I don't understand I dislike and I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, react except adversely to almost all politics, pure politics. And there's been so much of it that I've blessed the fact that I never decided to be both a businessman and I knew also that if I was, I'd have to leave industry and develop and, uh, and devote myself to the other, to the political side. What excited you about being a business person or an industrialist and a leader of industry? Didn't excite me. But it, the only thing that excited me is the opportunities to create. That's something new. See a new, a new factory created, a new, a new plant being built, seeing employees, seeing new, new work being done. And of course, because I believe thoroughly and that uh, India must industrialize if it's got to find employment apart from, from, from the agricultural opportunities which I knew were very uh, there. 
So therefore the excitement was in, in seeing things done. Were you ever excited by the creation of wealth? No, and that is something I've never quite understood. Uh, I've never, I've never, I haven't acquired wealth myself. Uh, my father died uh, fairly heavily in debt because he had a large family and his habits of traveling between India and, and Europe were rather expensive. And, uh, and so I didn't start with, uh, with any wealth except some, the right of having some shares in, in Tata Sons. But um, to be, I've missed, I miss wealth in the sense that I think that if I had a real wealth, not, not the few lakhs of rupees that I might, I would be, I'd be able to do more, not for myself, but even for, even for, and particularly for others. But that hasn't uh, worried me and, uh, and I'm, in, we, I'm glad that I have no wealth, that, that, and perhaps that's one of the reasons why I'm well considered that people perhaps have discovered that really all, it's only the foreigners who seem to refer to me as the richest man in India. You mentioned the aspect that you were apolitical, but is it practically possible for someone in, in, in business to be divorced from the political process, particularly in India, mm. where there is so many decisions are political decisions Absolutely. that influence... No, you're, you're quite right, but one can still... When I meant that I was apolitical, is in the the operations of politics. I was a, a friend and a great admirer of Jai Prakash Narayan. I was a friend and admirer, naturally, of Jawaharlal Nehru. But even though I think both of them went wrong or made mistakes, and Jawaharlal, particularly in, in, uh, in being the man who introduced and kept in India for so long, even after his death, this socialism to which I, which I, which I consider the wrong types of socialism, bureaucratism, etc. But uh, I don't. I think I can. You can still be apolitical in regard to the way in which politics are operated, and uh, and and also and and oneself being prepared to participate in those operations. Have you felt the imperative to influence the political process in the sense of um, persuading governments to your point of view, um, lobbying? No, I never lobbied, yes. I, I, I don't call it, I've never <laughs> done any lobbying. But I've been an outspoken, if critic, if not sometimes critic, but uh, uh, proposer, proposer of policies that should be done and are not done, and not been done. Uh, for instance, um, nationalization of industries. The way it is done. For whose benefit? Has it improved them? Uh, will, it, uh, will it lead to more wealth for the country? Will they be better managed? All those, those, those considerations made me opposed to nationalization of industries, just blind in nationalization of industries, though quite accepting the fact that some industries or some activities must be done by the state. But uh, I forget what the question was. Is that, have you felt the imperative to influence the political process? I, I felt more and more concern with the fact that we in India had adopted the British parliamentary system. I was convinced uh, that it wouldn't work in India or it would result in the kind of way that it did. At the end of the day, are you, are you despairing of where the political processes in India might be leading us? No, you know, I'm <laughs> perhaps only because I'm, well, I'm a I'm a pessimist in the long term about what's going to happen tomorrow or at the elections or whatever happens. But I'm a, I'm a long term op optimist because I know, I know, I understand or I've learned to understand what is the people that are the Indians 
even the even the most the most uh, primitive of them the 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 basic soundness of these people be they tribals or be they harijans and therefore and india has has overcome so many so in over the centuries so many uh, reverses so many difficulties conquests by outsiders and all that that i can't believe I, i refuse to believe that they would allow the country to be to be got to a stage that some of the countries in the world have been and are could you even begin to define what this this quality was that that that, that makes india survive despite its politicians perhaps or very, some industrial very, it's very still difficult. <laughs> very difficult most <laughs> This is a question like most questions are not simple to answer and I don't have also the education to understand I'm not I mean I've not studied history except in small bits and local history say of France and so therefore I have I do not I consider myself quite incompetent but the fact that we are a, a conglomeration of such, such different kinds of people and yet amongst them there are always enough of them who are who have who seem to have inherited over the perhaps over the centuries or even the millennia uh, a certain common sense that uh, makes them resist to to pressures makes them revolt when they have to make them discipline when there is no other way one wouldn't think it was so now It's frequently argued that uh, at, at, at the time of independence uh, and then that whole period of struggle and immediately after independence, uh, the, the leadership of Gandhi and, 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 and those around him were able to draw into national life people of, of, of enormous stature, of, of vision, of education, of, of, of commitment, of integrity, uh, which isn't happening at the present time. Just leadership is, a, is not enough. Devoted leadership. Uh, if one has to if one has to be a leader in such a difficult environment as the indian one such a mixed one uh there must be a total devotion to the the deed sometimes just devotion is not enough jay prakash who i mentioned was a case in point he said he was a totally motivated totally devoted man of high intelligence but who could make up his mind for instance or who was so good so good a human being that he was prepared always to consider the views of others including his opponents beyond the needs of it he could have been i think he could have been a great leader after jawaharlal of course a great leader the the the, the kind of leader we needed and got at the time was vallabhbhai i often say to myself think Suppose that Vallabhbhai had been the young man and Nehru had been the older man and Vallabhbhai had would have been obviously would have become the prime minister of India certainly in the economic plan there would have been a total totally different situation than the one that exists today you frequently disagreed with pandit nehru um when you when you articulated or shared those disagreements what was his response i tried uh he liked me i loved him and admired him but when you on this kind of thing uh, economics which of which he knew very little uh, in my opinion uh, and certainly and certainly on uh, on socialism and how socialism could be established without without the loss of uh, loss of uh, economic freedom for the majority of the people anyway uh the I'm going to be careful what I say repeat your your question when you uh, spoke to Jawaharlal Nehru and and, and ah, yes. articulated yes. your disagreements on yes. his economic policies what well, was I'll his reaction it was very simple no I'll tell you what his reaction was that I had mentioned somewhere and go and see him it Uh, sometimes he didn't invite me even to have a a meal in uh, when it, to see the giant panda that he had you know and then i would try to to 
to bring the conversation to economics, nationalize, nationalization, bureaucracy. He was not only not interested, but he wasn't willing even to talk. And he had, he had, he had invented a little trick, was that when I started, if we sat fairly near each other, and there was a window not too far, the moment I, I began something like that, he turned around and looked out of the window. And I, I, got the, I got the message. In the case of Mrs. Gandhi, it was a slightly different way of doing it. When she began to lose interest in what you were saying, namely arguing against something she was doing, she would begin to pick up some of the letters or and start opening envelopes and pulling out, practically hinting that, look, I've got other things to do. So I take the message. Did you so have much to do with, with, with Mahatma Gandhi? No, very little. I, ca I saw him and I, I saw him a number of times. I called on him maybe personally three times in my life. So, no. But what was that interaction like? Was it? Oh, wonderful. The man was, <laughs> he'd immediately smile at you and talk to you and even crack a joke. Oh, so the feeling, uh, the f wonderful feeling. In fact, it makes me think that if only we would learn to smile at each other more often and treat the other as a friend, even when you have no, no reason to be friends, but you have no reason not to be friends. I think we'd be better off. And I find that because you were asking whether intrusion in my private life, people coming up, may be the reason that I am responsible for the fact that I'm inclined instinctively to like people uh, or to, you know, if, if somebody comes to me, uh, unlike most parts of the world and particularly in the urban world, in the big cities of the world, if you come up to, a, to somebody on the street, man or woman, and you've only got to ask them the time, the first reaction, is, is, one, is one that you can feel he's saying, uh, what does he want? He, he, he wants something from me or he's attacking me. And I find that, funny enough, which I can digress on, but I find that abroad and here, you look at people and you look at, and when you look at them, you smile. And they respond at once. There's, a, there's an extraordinary capacity for response that one never exploits. In the street, your driver, most people, when they take to driving and they are not professional drivers, become monsters at the wheel. <laughs> and then they become aggressive and hostile. Now you drive and somebody is either in the way or not, you smile at him and let him go. You get such a surprised and delighted and friendly look back, it's quite extraordinary. Well, that reminds me of the incident when you were drive, when you were sort of piloting a plane and at Paris Airport without any brakes. Yeah. That couldn't have got you a smile. What happened? Oh, what happened? <laughs> I crashed into into the when British was this and, and, and what were you in piloting? 1930 in a little plane, the one I'd flown, the one I'd flown from India to England for the Aga Khan Prize, which I hadn't got. And uh, there was nothing I could do because there was no way, there was no break to apply. And I belted myself. I could have, I tried to jump out and hold the plane, <laughs> being very light. And uh, instead of that, the man, the, the, the French air, airline that had started its engines, and that gave me a blast on the, on the tail. I just went round and round and crashed into this poor Argosy and broke some cables of it and they were furious of and I was I could well understand how could I be angry with them I had and the, and the passengers were waiting to to embark so they however they they were British and reasonable they charged me 25 pounds <laughs> you were to fly again in in, in 1982 um, to, to repeat the flight from Karachi to Bombay uh, do you still fly? Does it excite you? It would. But A, I haven't got it. We have no aeroplane to fly. The only aeroplane Tatas have are at Jamshedpur. And I don't live in Jamshedpur. But I, until recently, 
when going to Jamshedpur, I used to fly from uh, Calcutta to Jamshedpur, fly in the airline to, to Calcutta and then. And so I used to, and back again the, the other way. On those occasions, I used, with a, with a professional pilot by my side, I used to enjoy flying the plane just between Calcutta and Jamshedpur. But I think that at the age of over 80 is the time to forget that kind of thing. And uh, I wish I, if I were younger and if I had, had an aeroplane, I would, yes. It has been, after all, the greatest joy of my life is, is flying. One of your uh, many current concerns, passions almost, is your commitment to family planning, controlling India's population. Uh, it's, it's something that seems to have drifted away from the headlines, uh, drifted away from, uh, apparently, from the political agenda. Do you think that it is, in fact, feasible in the context of, of, of liberal democracies, a capitalist system, to impose the kind of controls and disciplines, the imperatives that might help us bring about to the level of population control that we need? Or is your argument the economic one that, that uh, as, as, as believed and practiced in many developed countries, that economic development will inevitably lead to a, a lowering of population growth rates? What is the strategy that you recommend or urge? Both. I think ultimately what you say is quite right. As the standard of living of the people increase and they want their children educated, etc. It'll be here, it'll happen here, but too late. Can never be too late because India will still survive, but it'll take too long and therefore one must find some ways of accelerating the process. And that can be done in two ways, a, ne a negative way as well as a, a, a positive way. Much of the difficulty in India is this obsession that the people of India have, particularly in the rural areas, uh, obsession to have boys. You're an a, a political figure. This is an election year. What would be your sort of, what would be the political agenda that you would urge uh, the political parties? What are your, what are the, what are the national priorities apart from yeah, but the national the priorities are not necessarily the priorities of the political parties. The political parties want to oust Rajiv Gandhi and the Congress. That's all. And take their place. They did it once, they made a mess of it. It may happen again, I doubt it, but it may happen again. Uh, if they succeed in uh, ousting the, the, the Congress, which I... I'm, as I say, as an apolitical animal, I don't, I'm not the judge, but if it does, then I think the same thing will happen. So therefore, I can't, I can't just urge, I know what I want, want any government in part to do. What? Well, all the things that we all know, that you know, continue to, uh, of course, concentrate on, on agriculture, concentrate on employment, because employment is what is needed in this country. Concentrate on things like population, the population problem which very little has been done in spite of all the money that is being spent. But as, 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 as a leader of industry, uh, a, a popular perception amongst many Indians, many of us, is, is, is that industry is responsible in its nexus with politicians, uh, with, 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 the, with the perpetuation, the creation of black money, uh, the exploitation of labor, the supplying of poor quality goods, uh, of, of not responding sufficiently to foreign competition in terms of the initiatives of opening up the economy of the government. What would you urge your, 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 your colleagues in, in, in industry? And do you in fact see this, this nexus of, between uh, industry making payoffs to political parties to get uh, policies changed to its advantage? There's a whole universe of... Uh, Look, I have no... I'm not a leader. I have no colleagues in industry generally. Uh, only in my own group that I can influence or help or advise. But first of all, there is a change. I think that uh, from, a, from a technological point of view, management point of view, Indian industry, at least big industry today, is a very different 
animal to what it was when I first became uh, a director of Tatas. There is a, a, there is a, a quality consciousness that didn't exist in the old days. You must, we mustn't forget that it's not so long ago, perhaps a hundred years ago, when nobody would touch a Japanese product. Now they are the, le they are the leaders, perhaps in most products, largely on the basis of quality. So, first of all, the, there is a big change. Then labor. What are you talking about with the dominance of the unions, backed by the politicians? There is no opportunity to exploit labor. In fact, I believe that probably the only labor that is being really exploited in our country is those are those who are employed by small sector small sector industry, which is greatly encouraged by, by government. Rightly, because I want the small sector to become big sector. That's, I don't want a few big groups. Uh, and with, the, uh, with that power of the unions, as I say, backed by the, uh, supported by the, or not opposed by the politicians, there's no chance of exploitation. In fact, it is the other way. Today you cannot modernize, you cannot make good products cheap or cheaper than they, they would be otherwise, except with modern equipment and modern processes. The unions do not want any change. Modern, yes, modernization they will accept. The days are gone where they, they, they wouldn't allow even a typewriter. But they still oppose computers or the full exploitation of computers. But you can't reduce, you can only modernize and you can only cheapen the cost by using modern processes which need less and less and less labor. But how do you introduce a new process if you're not allowed to retrench? Or, or, by retrench, I mean really uh, pay off. There are very large amounts that would, that industry would be prepared to, to pay, and is prepared to pay. But the unions don't, don't accept it at all. Black money. Look, when I was young uh, and joined business, there was no black money. I never heard of black money. There was no corruption. Because whom were, were, were you to corrupt when you did not have a... Uh, when you, you did not have a, a system of government control where you had to get a permit for everything. I'm surprised you didn't have to get a government permit to change the position of the upholstery, the, chair, the chairs in this room. This is a Tata hotel. Well, maybe it's, if, it had been, if it had been a government hotel, you probably wouldn't have been allowed to do that without consulting a joint secretary somewhere in Delhi. But anyway, therefore, then also in those early days, Taxes were either non-existent or very low. You may not know that, uh, say, take 90 years ago, 100 years ago, uh, the, high, the salary of the highest government official, who in those days would be either a, a high court judge or the secretary of the government, they were the highest. And I think the black, the black money will always be there, so long as the taxes are high and the controls are high. I, look, I often have to go abroad. But every time I go abroad, although I'm supposed to be a leader, a doyen, not a leader, a doyen of industry, if I want to have a little cash money to spend in London or in New York, for my hotel bills, if somebody else doesn't pay for the hotel, for buying anything, I've got to go to the Reserve Bank and they will give me, as, li as they do it well, they do it, they are kind, they are, they, are, they are reasonable, but still you've got to go to a bureaucrat and say, may I have a little money? Then when I come back, if there is any left, any traveler check or thing, you've got to hand it over. All these kind of rules and uh, the regulations are, would be considered just un, not acceptable anywhere else. But we have to 
accept, at least so long as there are good intentions and so long as administration is better, so long as business is getting better, so long as the monsoon is better, I think we've got to, we've got to live with what there is and cooperate. Now what is it that makes you happy, excites you, exhilarates you now? Now that you're not flying, you're not driving fast cars? Nothing. I haven't got... I have none of these. The pursuit of happiness uh, is one that would have to be defined in detail first. But the per pursuit of happiness, in my case, doesn't involve... First of all, even if I wanted to, like other people might want, to travel abroad more, spend money, uh, live exceptionally well, uh, buy a car when I'm in Europe if I'd want to, etc. All these, all these ideas have totally gone. So I do the best of what there is available, and and I'm happy that I'm happy that on the whole. I tell you, this is important that one should feel that those you've dealt with, and even now practically the public, or somewhat, uh, what is it, a man who's, uh, who suffers an aberration, what would you call, uh, call him, an aberrated man? <laughs> yes, well. Like, like you, think well of me, something that at least you, uh, brings happiness. That if other people think that you brought happiness to others and that you've been useful and continue to be useful, uh, that's a form of happiness. It's, uh, and I think it's worth it's worth uh, cultivating. So I have no intention of breaking loose. <laughs> <laughs>